Megan, any any thoughts? What I've really been focused on um, is what we went over one of the first weeks, actually, which is um, my really becoming aware of my reaction to certain things and then reframing. Um, so I think that stayed consistent. And as well, I've also been using the um, – uh, writing down my like top three work priorities and top three personal priorities of each day. Um, which for me, I always have a grocery list of work items to accomplish, but I tend to neglect, um, the things that I need to do just for me, like, you know, going for a run or calling a friend or something. Um, so all of, all of those habits have been really helpful. Dion, any thoughts from uh, last week? I like the concept of reflect and get, kind of gain the self-awareness and then not staying there, right? So I think that that progression that you talk about, the imprint, um, inspire, right? That, that progression I think is really important. And I think it's I think it's always a good reminder, at least for me, that we have more power than we think we do. And we're not beholden to the chains or, you know, whatever the past is, right? right. Our future is going to create. So I thought that was kind of my big takeaway. And then from an overarching principle and then, you know, digging into just like Megan was saying is, okay, why am I feeling this way and what's going on? So that heightened sense of self-awareness and then choosing an appropriate response versus a reaction to it. So I think it was it was good. When we talked about the implanted mindset, my my thought that I didn't share last week is that uh, you know the implanted, imprinted, inspired mindset. The implanted mindset is limiting because we grew in up in an environment where we not we're not our full self that we are today. Uh, but the exposure to parents and caretakers is is like being exposed to a, a new government that has a legislative, ex executive, and judicial branch. And it is really the judicial branch that uh, uh, survives as, as we become adults, that we are judging ourselves too much in the same way we were judged by our parents. And, uh, and there has to be a handoff at one point where we let go of that belief, like uh, we have to be really good for everybody. We have to do our jobs. And, uh, and, and ultimately the goal is to become your own parent. To be, like uh, Natalie was uh, telling the story last week where she talks about uh, you know, being by herself at age 13 and, uh, and uh, my, uh, dad was not available. Her mom was absent um, in, in a certain way, but yet she was in the background. But uh, she reached out to people that uh, uh, as substitutes for uh, her parents. And, um, and, and it's a hard way uh, to grow up, but she developed a mechanism for coping and I think that's that's the interesting part of, of that story, that the the parental environment is limiting. But when we go to the next level, to the imprinted mindset, that is a, an area for expansion where we can expand in, in unlimited ways because there are always mentors available. There are always people available that uh, uh, feel honored to, to mentor you or give you advice and, and help you grow. Mary, uh, you want to chime in? I found it a very useful um, exercise, especially like when I think about, I liked how you had the, the self-limiting relationship beliefs because I find like one of my main stressors is just, uh, uh, you know, having to deal, I work remotely even before this COVID, but, you know, it's just sort of like the relationship stressor. So really just kind of starting with, you know, thinking about what, what my old belief is and how maybe, you know, I'm kind of feeding into things. So I found yeah. that really helpful. Um, thank you. And uh, one, one piece of advice I want to share along those lines. Once you 
transform your belief and you make an attempt to let go of the old belief system. Uh, and some people say, well, um, you know, Uma said last week, um, I need to be loved uh, in a relationship. And uh, uh, other people, uh, you know, may express that differently. But in order to move forward, once you uh, sort of make that attempt at a belief transformation, you can also um, change some of your behaviors, which is to ask uh, people that you are related to, that you want to relate better, that uh, you want to have a better relationship, ask mm -hmm. them three simple questions. One is, what am I doing that you like? What, what, what should I do more of that you like? Uh, and, and the second question is, what am I doing you like less? Uh, you know, and, and how can I minimize that? So uh, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not going to cross wires with you. Or uh, the third question would be, what am I doing uh, that you would, uh, what can I do that you would like me to do? So you, you uh, make an attempt instead of uh, complaining that, uh, you know, you never listen to me um, to ha engage in a more constructive uh, dialogue. Mm -hmm. And I think from a, from a business relationship point, it's the same thing. You know, when uh, uh, Dan is going to talk about curiosity, and I, th I think that uh, they're, they're, they're really, to me, uh, two levels of curiosity. One is an automatic curiosity, where when you meet somebody, where you're from, what do you do? Um, how did you get here? Or, you know, um, very trite questions uh, that are on the surface. But if you're more curious, then uh, you could ask question, you know, what, what is the, the best thing that happened to you this year? Or where did you grow up? Uh, or what do you do for fun? Or uh, another good question is, what, what's your favorite superhero and, and why? So you, you can... Uh, sort of break the ice when you work from home, uh, you know, make a list of questions when you uh, get introduced to new people. And, um, you know, you, you may also ask them, what's the most, the most important thing that I should know about you? Uh, so we can have that, uh, that effective business relationship. Okay, thank you, that's helpful. All right, Dan, let's, uh, let's dive right in. Uh, you uh, you had that very unique uh, combination of uh, an academic, but also, um, you know, socially very um, savvy. Um, you, you know how to communicate and relate to people in, in a wonderful, engaging way. Um, what, what got you interested in the topic of curiosity? You know, I've always been a super curious person, but I've always been in sales. So I think having a sales background is critical for success in so many areas. We were talking a little bit about emotional intelligence earlier. And that uh, interest I had in studying emotional intelligence was about really sales I was interested in, finding out what made people successful. It was a curiosity to know, well, why is this one so much more successful than that one? And it got me interested in becoming uh, certified to give an emotional intelligence test. And that got me interested in assessments in general. And uh, I ended up writing a book with my daughter many, many years ago. It was called It's Not You, It's Your Personality. It was all about personality assessments and understanding DISC and Myers-Briggs and emotional intelligence. And just it was all very interesting to me to understand what makes people tick because um, I'm kind of a Nike person. I just do it kind of thing. And then I'd meet people who were good at waiting to the last minute. And, I, and then I would take a Myers-Briggs assessment and understand that some people are more motivated at, that, at the last minute. And you find out what the opposite of you is sometimes when you take some of these assessments. And I thought that that was really helpful and insightful, but I never really thought about writing about curiosity until I had my own show. I had wonderful people like Gerhard on, and I had all these really fascinating people from Steve Forbes to Keith Kroc from DocuSign and, uh, you know, billionaires, uh, uh, Ken Fisher, you name it. There is a Craig from Craigslist. He's been on my show. So there's all these people who were really super successful and they were all super curious. 
And then I still teach, you know, in addition to running my company where I teach people how to be curious and take my assessments and do all that stuff, I also teach for a lot of different uh, uh, universities. And I'm the, M the former MBA program chair at Forbes School of Business. And that's how I knew Steve and other people like that. But uh, what I find when I still teach, I teach probably 10 courses at a time still in addition to running my businesses, is all my students, you know, you talk to them and some of them are like, yeah, just, just tell me how to do it. They, they just want you to give them the fish instead of teach them to fish. And I'm like, no, you, you really need to learn why, why behind this. And as I started to think about that, I, I started to write a book about curiosity to kind of just explain it. And there are all other books about curiosity. There's assessments that'll tell you uh, if you're curious or not. But I'm like, well, what if I'm not? Then what do I do? So that's what I wanted to fix. I wanted to see what do you do when you find out you have an issue and what's holding you back? And once you could find out those things, then you could move forward. So I've always been the kid that said, why, why, why? But I got passionate about writing about curiosity uh, just a few years ago when I started the radio show, probably. How would you describe the, um, you know, if, if curiosity was a, uh, um, a palette and, uh, and a canvas, Okay. Um, what what um, colors would you use to paint an image that represents curiosity? Well, I think everybody paints a different image. And I think it's the question of the people who only want to use purples and oranges compared to the people who want to use all the colors. Uh, I, I think that's how I would describe it if you had to put it to me in those terms. Why not test out this color to see what it will do? So what if you get black or brown and it's not that pretty, you, at least you found that out in the process. And then you, you go on to the other part of the picture and, and make this or that. I think some of the most interesting things that we learn in our lives are through our mistakes of quote mistakes, which I don't think anything's a mistake. I think everything just teaches you something. And in sales, you learn a lot through mistakes. I mean, I was, uh, I mean, I have lots of mortifying stories being in sales of things that have happened to me, uh, you know, just in general, because a lot of times they, they teach us out of our curiosity sometimes because they'd give you these canned presentations to, to speak, you know, and then you'd get out in the field and you'd say these things and you'd feel like a total doof because you don't talk like that, right? <laughs> you'd have to say this sentence and then wait for them to say what they're never going to say. They told you they would say, and then you're at a loss. So you have to really think on your feet. And I think so back to your color representation, you, you want to have all those colors within your palette and don't just pick the colors you want because as Tony Alessandra says, you know, you, you have to treat people as they would want to be treated, not as you'd want to be treated. As the old golden rule used to be, it's now the platinum rule. And to know what they would want, you have to ask questions. You have to do this exploration, like Earhart said, you, you know, my who's your superhero? Hero? Uh, I don't know, Chris Hemsworth, because he looks like Chris Hemsworth, I guess. I don't know, Thor would be mine. But I think you have to ask people, and when you're in a sales setting, when you go into somebody's office and you're looking around, um, I had a boss who was just great. He was terrific. He would notice everything. He knew what school they went to, what, the, what color their kid's favorite color was, whatever it was, he was able to, to scan the room and figure it out. And I don't think we do enough of that, of looking at everything from their perception, their perspective. And that's why I guess my next assessment was on perception because I, I, I'm interested in what makes us tick and why we only look at things from our standpoint sometimes. And with curiosity, you have to ask questions and find out more about the other person. What is a better question? What or why? You know, there isn't a one better question. I think they're all good questions. I think I'd like to know why for, you know, the bottom line of how you get to things. But to find your why, I mean, Simon Sinek, of course, made all that very, uh, very popular. And I used his work. I used uh, Dan Pink's work for, with Drive. I found, I found Carol Dweck's work. If you haven't read Mindset, super important to read as well. So those are three really important authors. But I think you have to get to the bottom of um, just, I guess what I'm trying to get away from is status quo thinking. So why are we doing things this way? Why aren't we doing things a different way? Um, in my book, I gave a couple examples. One was a hospital in London. They were having problems with uh, taking people from their surgery over to uh, ICU with having more deaths occur than they'd like. 
and they kept trying to fix things the same old way that they've always fixed things and they couldn't make anything better and a couple of the executives were watching a formula one race car event one time on television and they saw the ferrari team take apart the car and put it back together in seven seconds without any problems and they're like well look at what they can do why can't we just move someone from here to there and so they actually had the race car people come into their hospital and look at what they were doing and give them some suggestions. So why aren't you doing it this way? Sometimes you need fresh eyes. You, you, you have to ask somebody outside of your cubicle, outside of your silo, outside of what your industry sometimes to find out, huh, because you, you don't know what you don't know unless you ask. So let, let's talk a little bit about the inhibitors. What inhibits uh, curiosity? Well, that was really interesting to me because I started to look for the assessment that determined what stock, you know, inhibited curiosity. And there wasn't one out there. There was like, you know, the big five factors of personality has openness to experience, which is kind of curiosity. There's a guy named Cashton. He studies curiosity, but they just told you if you're high or low level. And that didn't do me much good. If I had a low level, I didn't know how to fix it. So I created this assessment by years of research with thousands of people looking at the, the factors that keep people from being curious. And a lot of them were not surprising, um, but I came up with an acronym to remember the four things. And the four things that keep you from being curious are fear, assumptions, technology, and environment. So if you look at fear, who wants to look stupid? You're in a meeting and you're like, hey, Gerhard, why don't you ask the question? Because I don't want to look stupid. It's better if he looks stupid, right? We don't want to be the one to ask the question. We don't want to look not prepared. Or, you know, you're in a, a call on a, uh, in an office, uh, maybe you're talking to somebody, you don't want to ask them a question that they maybe ask you something back and you don't know the answer to. And rather than admitting you don't know the answer, you don't ask the question to get them started down that path. Uh, how many times have you, you know, it's so much easier to just say, hey, I don't know the answer to that question, but I know who does, I'll get right back to you. But a lot of us fear that looking dumb, looking unprepared, looking like we don't know what we're supposed to know. And you can't know everything. And I think people appreciate it more. When you start faking it, that's when you look really bad. And they don't, then they know they can't trust you. So fear is a huge thing, but you know, you, that's the kind of thing that it's all about just uh, working on developing an action plan uh, for all these things. You know, we look at kind of a personal SWOT analysis when I put people through this training that I do and they create ways to overcome some of these things. And sometimes it's baby steps. It's like, what about Bob? You just do a little bit, a little bit, a little bit until you get over this. And, it, and as you can develop this culture of curiosity within your company. And some of these companies really focus on that. Like I've had Xander Lurie on my show from SurveyMonkey. They've even changed their address to one curiosity way. They do so much. Um, I've had people from, you know, I work with Novartis and Verizon and they all work on curiosity. But if you're doing it personally, I mean, these are some of the things that you can deal with with fear. Assumptions uh, were the second thing I, that I found was um, more like that voice in your head, that nagging voice that tells you, it, oh, I, I can't uh, ask them about that because they're going to ask me to do something I don't know how to do or uh, whatever it is you tell yourself. I, I'm not going to be interested in um, learning about that because I've studied it in the past and it was boring or, you know, you, you talk yourself into or out of things, either into not doing something or out of doing something or what, you know, and so recognizing what you tell yourself of that you're not interested in or what would be too hard or what you've taken in the past that doesn't interest you. Uh, some, some of these things, they, they're very limiting. And uh, it's like a glass of water. If you hold it for a little while in your hand, it doesn't do much. You hold it a little bit longer, it gets heavier. The whole longer you hold it, your arm starts to get paralyzed. That's how our thoughts are, you know, fleeting thought, no big deal. After a while, it paralyzes you into not doing anything. So that's what your assumptions do. And then technology is kind of um, interesting to me. I wasn't really expecting that one as much. And what it is, is the under and over utilization of it. Some of us would have been great mathematicians if somebody hadn't just thrown you a calculator. And if you, but you don't know all the, how, the thought process behind it, you're relying on this calculator. You're, you're utilizing technology too much, or you might have had this other interest had you known the foundation behind it. And otherwise, sometimes we, we don't use it enough. We could have all this great, you know, customer management system or whatever it is that we want to to work in that we're afraid to do it because it laugh. Oh, they just updated it. I have to learn a whole new update. You become overwhelmed. And, and 
So a lot of this stuff, is, it ties into that voice in your head and fear, you know, it kind of overlaps sometimes. Tell us a little bit more about uh, the under and over utilization of technology. Uh, why is under utilization of technology uh, uh, an inhibiting factor? Well, let's say you could really keep very successful records in Salesforce or some other kind of a system that you, you use. And instead, uh, you, you just don't really want to figure out all the bells and whistles because it's, it's, it's something that becomes overwhelming to you. But you're actually losing productivity time because you don't take the time. Sometimes you've got to take the time to get to learn something so that later you're much more efficient in the long run. So sometimes it's the underutilization in that case. Overutilization would be, you know, you're just asking Siri or Alexa to answer everything and you don't even know any reason why anything works. And so I think it's really important to have days where you use a lot of technology and you learn it and you find out foundations behind it. And then other days, no tech days, to, you know, back to Simon Sinek, leave your phone out in the hallway, have really meaningful conversation days and just mix it up a little bit. I think sometimes we become one way or the other too much. And uh, then the last one was environment, which is a huge one for everybody. Uh, back to Carol Dweck's work, you know, we know that kids, when you tell them, wow, you worked really hard at that, you must, you did a, such a great job, they're going to have an open growth mindset, and they're going to want to try harder to work harder to learn more. But if you say, oh, you're a natural at that, you must not have had to try too hard, you know, because you're just a natural, then they're not going to have that open growth mindset, they're going to have a fixed closed mindset, and not develop and, and grow more. So what we we have like teachers who have to teach to the test. We have parents who say, you know, you've always gone into the company business. You should go into the company business. I mean, think of my big fat Greek wedding. I mean, there's, there's families that, you know, direct you a certain way. And there's, you, you just don't even recognize your siblings, how cruel they sometimes are. If you like something they don't like, or, you know, your bosses have said things to you in the past that you don't even recognize. I had a boss, I asked him how to do something once. I'd never been taught, never needed to know how to do something. And he looked at me and he said, I'm going to pretend I didn't hear that. So what does that tell me? That tells me, I'm, well, either I'm stupid or you shouldn't ask questions or, you know, there, there's all these things that environment can impact. And that could lead to fear and other things that you don't even know you're facing. So I think what was really helpful to me is I have these little things I do in my training sessions where I, I have, give them a little things to write down. Like for fear, I'll tell you, you know, list some of the reasons you don't ask questions due to fear of failure, embarrassment, loss of control, and, and kind of flesh out some of those ideas that are holding you back. And assumptions, list some of the things that uh, you tell yourself that keeps you from exploring new things. I do that with the assumptions. So to see if you're just disinterested, or you're apathetic, whatever it is that's holding you back. Technology, are you overwhelmed? Is it too much, you know, not enough training? What is it that makes you over or underutilize technology? And then in your environment, how is your, your education, your family, your friends, your teachers, anybody that you've ever interacted with, how have they impacted you? And I, I suggest watching a couple um, TED Talks that I think are great on creativity uh, because they tie into curiosity. Curiosity is the spark to creativity, motivation, and drive. And I've had all the experts on the show uh, very, you know, who study that say so. But if you haven't seen Sir Ken Robinson's TED Talk or George Land's talk or Carol Dweck's talk, or you know, all those are all really critical to understand the importance of this, of how certain things are getting us out of our natural uh, sense of curiosity and creativity. If you look at a chart of how we all are born super curious. I mean, everybody, birds, everybody, every animal, every creature, like a bird, if it wasn't curious, it would eat all the berries on a bush and not care to look at another bush and then it's going to die, right? So we have this innate curiosity. And if you look at charts around age five, we peak and then we tank once we get into our, the, you know, school and everybody around us that doesn't have time to answer the why, why, why questions that kids have. So I think we have to recognize that as parents, of course, but now that we're older, we have to recognize how we were impacted. And now if you can recognize what inhibits you, then you're able to create an action plan, measurable goals, smart goals that you can think about. Let's do this personal SWOT analysis. What are my opportunities? What are my threats? What are my weaknesses? And kind of like you would do if you took an engagement survey in, at work, you know, put it into your plan. This is how I'm going to improve. 
And uh, you, you just don't recognize that. I think so many people are so uh, fearful of failure that they just stop. They don't, they don't surround themselves with enough people who know more than they do, which is huge. I know Gerhardt and I have worked on the board at DocuSign. I'm on the global mentoring network that Keith Kroc had set up, who was the former chairman of DocuSign. He set up this mentor network that, you know, if you get mentors who value curiosity, they'll bring that out in you. And I really think that that's a really critical thing. Uh, I think it's so important to be curious about uh, your own beliefs, uh, because when you match curiosity with a certain belief, then um, a growth is inevitable. And what I mean specifically, when um, last week we talked about, um, you know, the core beliefs about relationships, about education, about work, about money, about success and, and physical fitness. So if you just take one of those and, um, uh, you know, let, let's say fitness. Um, if you are not curious of how you can push the envelope, um, you, you're always going to do the same thing over and over and over. But if you're curious, then you ask yourself, uh, you know, I, I give you one example. When, when I got my first Fitbit, like uh, five years ago, I was amazed that, you know, that I have a heartbeat and, and it relates to exercise. I mean, I was really ignorant. And then I thought, well, how can I be more in the, in the zone where I achieve optimal functioning? Um, what will happen if I take 10,000 steps a day? And if I keep it up for two weeks, three weeks, then all of a sudden I realized my heart rate goes down. I sleep better. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to explore how can I be more fit? Um, and, and I think sometimes we need technology to tell us, hey, there's another world. There's another way to think about it. There's another way to behave or to, to, to live. And uh, to me, the, you know, we, we started earlier, we talked about relationships. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about how can we get people to be more cur curious about themselves and about their beliefs with, with the intentions to improve? Well, as you're talking about that, it, it ties into what the whole reason for why I wanted to, to write and, and create this uh, instrument um, was because I want people to get out of status quo thinking. And it doesn't matter if it's in your exercise routine if it's at work, it's in your whatever, sometimes we just buy into the, this is the way I've always done things and I'm gonna keep doing it this way. And we know with that exercise that if you keep doing the same exercise, you're not gonna stimulate different muscle groups and you're gonna end up not really getting that much better. You have to mix it up. And it's kind of the same way in every situation. You know, there's a, a National Geographic study where they looked at how people buy into status quo thinking. And what they did was they looked at this woman uh, who came into a doctor's ex uh, office thinking she's getting an eye exam. And, and what it was, was just to look at, see how people go along with the status quo. And what they did was they surrounded her with all these people who were there as actors for this experiment. And they rang the bell e every couple minutes to, and everybody around her would stand up and sit down without any explanation at all, just to see how she would react. And eventually, after the bell just ringing three times, she got up and sat down with them. And now she doesn't know what she's doing. It's called social learning, right? She's just going along with the group. It's status quo thinking. And they thought, well, this is really interesting. Let's take all the people out of the office and see what she does. And they took them all out uh, one at a time as if they're getting their eyes examined. So she's there by herself and the bell goes off and she still stands up and sits down without anybody there. Now, she's following this random rule because that's the way she's always done it. That's what she thinks is supposed to be done. So they thought, well, let's add people to the op office who are real patients and see what, how they'll respond to this. So as people sat down next to her, the bell rang, she stood up and sat down. The guy next to her says, you know, why did you do that? And she goes, well, I did it because everybody else was doing it. I thought I was supposed to. And so she just bought into this random rule, doesn't know why she's doing it. And that's what we do every day. We just go, okay, this is how we've always done it. We don't question why we've always done it. We don't question different ways of doing it. In the exercise realm, you know, if you really want to get better and improve, you can't do the same thing the same way all the time. And it's the same way in anything that you do. 
So I, I really want people to question status quo thinking in general. It's not just let's get curiosity for curiosity's sake and I'm going to see how to get down to the bottom of Candy Crush. This is, this is serious, you know, goal-oriented, focused. Think about why we do this this way. What other ways are there? What are other people doing? And that we're back to kind of mentoring, even if we're in the gym. How, that, how does this person do it? Sometimes you have to ask a lot of questions and not be so, everybody's very laser focused on what they've always done because it's comfortable, right? You know how to do this. If I lift it 10 times, it's easy and I don't have to lift it anymore. That, it doesn't take that much thought. I get out and go. But your arms aren't looking much different. You're not getting any better because you, you haven't mixed it up. And it's the same thing with your brain. I mean, it's just, it, if you develop curiosity, you also release dopamine, which is the feel-good transmitter. We found out that you feel better, you live longer. There's so many benefits to it. But the cure for the fear is the fear of getting over it sometimes. You have to get past that. But you have to start recognizing that you even have this fear. And you have to start recognizing that you're, you're just buying into the same old way of doing things because it's comfortable. So that's the ABC formula, always be curious. Yes, always be curious. Uh, so let's, um, I'm curious uh, about the questions that are going on in, um, in the group's mind. Uh, maybe we open it up and uh, I, I'd like to hear one question from everybody. So I guess I got a question about like, again, like why uh, that example you said, why we do things I guess, isn't that how we learn? Isn't that how we talk to learn, uh, talk to learn like socialization? Like we're going to learn, we're going to do it because that's what the, that's what this particular, let's say community is doing. That's what society is doing. So isn't that a major part of learning? And then if we are doing something different, aren't we looked at as, as we're odd, you know, going against the grain sort of thing and not in a good way, right? So, hey, why we're all doing this you know, the whole group thing, right? We're all doing this, but this person's doing that. Hey, there must be something wrong with that person. So how do we address that? The learning and then doing something different and looking out of place. I think that that's what a lot of people are thinking in their heads. I don't want to look out of place. And that's a great question because, you know, I, I think that if all the times that there is a time where we're going to have less of that pressure is now with COVID, because we know we have to think differently. We know that what was working isn't working necessarily. We haven't been prepared. We aren't crisis ready. There's a lot of issues that people are really focused on now that they're much more open to, well, if we suggest this, and, and if you are suggesting things with people, you give them a reason. You just don't randomly um, provide new ideas and new things, you know, and I think I have a lot of people in the companies for which, you know, I, I work in Novartis and, and Verizon. And, you know, when, when we were talking about this, we, we set up a, a, the um, softening of when we're asking questions or when we're providing some kind of ideas that are kind of outside the box or unusual. Like, you know, I'm trying to work on developing my curiosity because I think it'll make me more innovative. I hope you don't mind. If I ask you a question, I normally wouldn't ask. You know what I mean? That softens what you're saying. You know, I, I think that anybody who's truly successful, the Steve Jobs and the Wozniaks and everybody of the world did things a little bit differently. And I think we, the younger generations are now a little more open than maybe Gerhard's and my generation was in the day to people asking more questions because we know that the technology to really be cutting edge, to really be the best salespeople to be whatever it is we're trying to be, we, we have to, to recognize that. And in the sales environment, they know that building relationships are critical to success. I mean, you know, communic communication uh, problems and conflict costs uh, so much money. And if you buffer it with whoever you're, with whomever you're talking, you can explain, you know, just, you know, this is something I'm trying to develop, trying to find better ways of doing it and, and show people what's in it for them. You know, they want to know about them. They don't care what's in it for you as much as you do. You know, they want to know, why, why would I want to answer this for you? Why? And just, you know, because I know you are, are trying to save money, I, I just want to ask you a question. You know what I mean? Because I, you know, buffer things. And, you know, I talk to uh, project managers and they got, you know, they got to get things in on time. They don't want people throwing an extra, you know, thing in the wrench, monkey wrench into the mix. You know, they, I understand that. But, if you don't have alternatives and consider alternate paths for in case of situations, you run into what we have now with COVID, 
where nobody can f- do it, nobody's prepared. So we need to have that questioning and thinking outside the box. Just a comment. Uh, kids are freaking curious. Yeah. <laughs> you can't stop them from asking why, but our school system beats it out of them. As soon oh, as they yeah. get to like grade two, it's like, pay attention, do what we tell you. And the paradox is, is that great innovation comes from curiosity and great relationships. So uh, not only do we have to get our adults to do it, how do we get our schools to basically go, Maybe have a one lesson a day on curiosity. Yeah, you know, that's such a great point. I, I serve on several boards, and one of them is a K through 12 uh, soft skills, emotional intelligence, that type of uh, uh, not for profit. And they do that outside of the school, uh, in conjunction with the schools, um, outside of the school hours, and they work on those kinds of things. I think, you know, I'm not a K through 12 expert, but I, I teach more um, higher ed, but I do see the impact of that from the time they come into my classes, that there isn't that sense that those skills are really developed. I teach a lot of critical thinking, a lot of things that should have been foundational in, in, in our youth. I mean, there's no question that the education system needs help, uh, that we you know, aren't paying our teachers enough to do a lot of the things we're making them teach to the test. They've got a lot of kids and they're, they're all asking different directions. It's a challenge. So a lot of it has to come from parents too. A lot of us have our own kids and we can develop, I mean, I, I grew up in a family that was super curious. We played school every night at the dinner table and my dad would ask a different question of each of us, depending on our age group, age appropriate questions. And if you missed the question, you were a third of a hippopotamus and you didn't want to be a whole hippopotamus if you missed all three questions by the time it came around to you. you know? I mean, there's things we could do as parents. And I think maybe that developed my sense of curiosity. You know, If you look at people like Wozniak, of what he developed and wasn't really so much from school as his father, he gives more credit, who would come home, who was literally a rocket scientist in some of the books I've read, says that's what he did. He brought home all of his gadgets and stuff from work and he would take young Wozniak and go, well, here, this is this wire, this attaches to this because it needs electricity for this reason. And he got real specific with his kid to kind of give him the think the thought process, not just here, let's just play with a bunch of wires, right? So some of it's up to parents, some of it's up to teachers, some of it, you know, you could pay for better schools, but you know, the thing is, it's, it's the reality of the school system and it's something that needs changing. I, that's why I think Ken Robinson's talk was so impactful. It's one of the most watched TED talks of all time because he says the school system's uh, teaching us out of our capabilities. And it's something that I wish I could solve, but uh, I, you know, uh, working a little bit at a time to make sure people hear the importance of curiosity. Uh, Diane, thank you for being on the call today. And, and, and uh, uh, before I ask my question, I must say it, it's good to be a fellow alum with you. I see the plaque behind you there from North ah, Central. Uh-huh. I finished my PhD from North Central about a year and a half ago. Congratulations. So, uh, awesome. Uh, good program. I've enjoyed that. Uh, I'm, I, too, am a professor at the higher education level in Dallas. And, and everything you've said is exactly right. Everything that we get hit with from an uh, academic uh, administrative standpoint is really about uh, not teaching people what they need to know to be successful in life. It's about teaching them how to make a good grade. And, right. uh, and so we were under a lot of pressure for that as well. And that's unfortunate. It sometimes makes it a bit disheartening uh, for us as faculty. And when I teach sales uh, to not try to focus more on the experiential piece of, of being a great person, being a success, successful person. And then my, my question for you has to do, you mentioned emotional intelligence. Uh, a lot of the work that I did for my dissertation was on motivation and, and value of the outcome and those kind of things. And one of the things that I spent a lot of time on was this <clears throat> this locus of control piece, you know. And off of what Mark was saying a minute ago about, you know, we oftentimes we, we're, we're not real sure about doing things if we think people from the outside are going to look maybe negatively on us. And then now with this COVID thing going on, there's a lot of things happening that we really don't have any control over. And that's having a pretty negative impact on a lot of people, both as as selling representatives, as sales leaders, but also as customers and and the buyers that we're talking with on a daily basis. You know, and just just maybe the question to you is simply, what what are your thoughts on that? Is is that is that something that we can coach to? Uh, what 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 how do you feel that can be addressed as we go forward? You're asking me if we could coach to having people get over that need for control? Yeah, the, the loss of the locus. You know, the, most of the time, the, 
locus of control, of course, has to do with whether they can, they feel right. like they are in control of their situations right. or if their situation is in control of them. And I think right now, a lot of people are succumbing to the idea that the, the outside situations are controlling them and they don't know how to respond to that. Yeah, it, it's the sense of that you, you don't really know all the answers to everything. Everybody wants to know that they're, they're in control and you get this helplessness feeling. And I know it, it's very challenging in, in every industry right now. I think the, the ones who seem to be coping the best are the ones that have foresight and were proactive in their approach to what would happen. And I think right now, I think if, if you weren't that way in the past, I think I would spend this time now recognizing, okay, well, you can't change the past. And right now, this is our chance to revamp how we prepare for future issues. And, you know, the, the seven habits, we know the first habit from Stephen Covey is be proactive, right? So, this is what I think we need to question, really looking at some of the experts out there. I've had Tom Peters and I've had all these great people on my show who've shared their, their most unbelievable books. But I think Covey's book is timeless in the fact that we need to recognize these habits that help us really become critically successful. You're never, control is an illusion to some extent. And that's why I uh, wrote about perception because, you know, I don't know how much control any of us really have at any time. I think the, the control we thought we had has definitely been changed in this. And some people ended up having more control than they realized. Uh, and ask the Zoom people, they're thrilled right now, right? But other, other people, maybe not so much because, you know, the hotel, Marriott's lowest quarter ever, right? So there's a lot of things going on right now that are making people take a look and doing some introspection of, you know, what's, what's important? How will I re react to these things? And then we're back to asking questions. What, what could I do to prevent the sense of um, feeling out of control in the future? Why do I feel out of control? What kinds of things do I think I need to control or can I control? And we're back to curiosity. Asking these questions will, will help us develop a, a plan of action so that we're not floundering when things um, happen. You know, it, it's curiosity is that spark to a lot of the things you said you studied motivation, right? And you look at all, all of these things. If you're looking at being more innovative and, and having control and having emotional intelligence and any of the ingredients that we know everybody's trying to, to to incorporate at work all these issues engagement everything everybody's trying to improve those are the ingredients think of it like baking a cake you're baking a cake you're mixing flour and oil and water and you're putting it in a pan you're putting it into oven and what happens well you're hoping for cake right but if you didn't turn on the oven you don't get cake you get goo so that's kind of how it is with curiosity the, the ingredients are, uh, you know, this innovation, engagement, all these things, and everybody knows motivation and all this is important, but the spark to all that is curiosity. That's the oven. You got to turn on the oven to get cake. Jerome, I think you asked a, an interesting question and um, you're locked in on the issue of control. Um, I think control is really an illusion um, that we are buying into. We cannot control anything, but we control, we can influence a lot more than we think. And um, I, I know that Diane did some, some research on that. And I, uh, when she said that a, lo a lot of people were not aware that they had a lot more control than they thought. Uh, but uh, I think once you shift your mindset from control to influence, then you and be curious about what are the spheres of influence that you can uh, engage and uh, and sort of solicit to help you achieve your goal, then you achieve a lot more. And I think that, uh, you know, uh, when Diane talks about uh, uh, the oven analogy, I think you, you can bake a lot of great things, um, but you want to make clear, uh, want to be clear whether what you're baking is actually going to nourish you and help you reach what you want to achieve. Nicely stated. Analogy extension. <laughs> <laughs> um, who else would like to ask a question? It's been really interesting to, to listen, and I've been writing down some notes on how this applies to what I was going to talk about today. I'm going to talk about today. But um, I a big one for me, obviously, is music is such a great tool, both in 
um, developmental stages for people to to be curious. And there's two sides of it because you have to learn the rules with music and then you need an ownership. And I think that's where our education system fails students is that we're trying to teach the rules, but there's just not enough time often across mm-hmm. math, across right. the sciences to get curious. And I'm right now reading um, the Durrell books. And if you guys have ever read the series, he's very curious. And I think now he's a, you know, biologist and he's gone on to, to use this in his life. But um, in these, these stories of his childhood where he's so curious about nature and bugs and he's fascinated mm. in finding all these bugs and stuff. And I was just thinking there's so many ways where you can be curious outside of a, you know, a sort of environment where you're with your computer and working mm-hmm. and that can hopefully train the muscle to, to make it easier in other ways. And I was just thinking about how we can be curious in our, in music and nature, then also sports and cooking, which we've been talking about and crafting and those things that like seem, uh, you know, I, I'm very, I've actually never taken Myers-Briggs, but I think if you're, if you're, if you're a doer, sometimes you're, or if, um, I don't forget her name, but uh, she was saying like, I can make countless to-dos for my work, but not for myself. Even something as simple as what color am I going to paint my nails? Like the curiosity of like, you know, something personal and, and stuff can help us uh, start to train that muscle to, I think. Yeah. You know, I think a lot of us can develop it at, at work uh, sometimes easier than at home. I don't, or vice versa. I, I know yeah. as you're saying that I was thinking how I hike a lot and a lot of times I'm doing it for the exercise and I forget to look around and wonder I mean, we saw a giant bee hive and I'm thinking, you know, and then I started getting curious how they built this thing, you know, and then you start to, if you pay attention to outside things and instead of, sometimes we just zone out and we just kind of do what we do and we don't even pay, how many times have you driven home and you go like, how did I even get here? I don't even remember where I, <laughs> where I was. So sometimes just taking different routes to work just reading a different section of the newspaper, just doing something slightly different, do a different exercise at the gym that somebody else does. Do, do one thing different every day than you would normally do, and you can incorporate some changes. Uh, just little things uh, every day might open up a world. You might uh, you know, find that you like a certain kind of music that you never have listened to on the radio uh, if you only listen to one station all the time, or, or just just pick a random thing on iHeart just to listen to. Uh, those are the things that open up opportunities that you just never had considered before. I, um, I do that sometimes with uh, my, I have a, you know, hundreds of books in my office. And um, I learned from uh, Mortimer Adler, who was the editor of the Encyclopedia Britannica. And he changed my belief system about books. Uh, and he says, he actually wrote a book on how to read a book. And, uh, and, and then uh, I sort of experimented because I do get a lot of books from, um, from uh, authors that want to get published in Selling Power. Right. So what I do is now I open a new book at random in the middle somewhere and read one paragraph. And if I like that paragraph, then I go a little bit more to the front and read a paragraph. And if I like that, um, I, I pull something from the back. And if a book um, intrigues me three times, then I want to I wanna write about it. <laughs> or I want to interview the author. Yeah. So I, I, and I sometimes go to my library and just pick out a book and just get one nugget. And, uh, and every author, I mean, you, your book is wa- wonderful. Thank you. Um, and I recommend that anybody who is on the call now to, to read it, uh, because to me, curiosity is uh, a step up from the routine into a higher level of consciousness where you discover something new. And, and to me, that's part of the the inner magic, which is the inspired mindset. That's uh, curiosity is the source of inspiration for us. Uh, Megan, would you like to ask a question? So I have, I think you answered, I had two, but you answered one of them already. Um, So my second question, um, 
a lot of times, uh, whether it's so talking, speaking to like adult learning, um, I often am helping to like orchestrate um, workshops or orientation events for either new hires who are learning a completely new company, right? Or for salespeople who need to learn an entirely new topic. And I'm wondering um, if you have any tips on how you kind of plant seeds or encourage people to uh, get comfortable being kind of curious in those environments. Um, A lot of the time we do these role plays and it's kind of like, there's always this awkward silence that you just have to kind of like hold for a while before Mm -hmm. that first person like really engages. Um, So I'm curious to hear your insight on that. Sometimes I find that just having humor incorporated beforehand, making fun of whatever it is you're, you're, you're doing the self deprecation thing. This like the trip Crosby, uh, the conference call in real life. And if you guys have not seen that YouTube video, it's a must watch because it's just making fun of what happens in conference calls, all the things that could go wrong. Sometimes if you're going to have people do something, creating something about just making fun of light of, and we're going to make it as playful. I think having things so serious sometimes makes people more stressed out. If, if everybody knows we're going to play Jeopardy today to have team building, to learn our new product and we're going to have fun and we're going to razz the other team. If they, you know, it, everybody's playful and having fun instead of, well, there's a test today. We're going to learn, you know, this, I, I think adding fun to any kind of training is, is what I've, found is really helpful to me that the consequences are and salespeople are super competitive right so if you're talking to salespeople have a a a prize have a something that's in it for them for asking questions setting up the stage for who wants this kind of thing asking questions beforehand to just set the stage for the curiosity awesome yeah thank you you're welcome uh, by the way, Diane, uh, are you aware that uh, Lego makes a, uh, a set for um, uh, adults? I used it once in a, in a sales enablement uh, meeting in Washington, D.C. I asked them just to uh, build something tall and uh, work together as a group at the table. So there was oh, one yeah. sort of observer and one somebody uh, keeps the time. Uh-huh. And then, and then they realized that they they wanted to compete with one another, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. and they didn't build a big enough fund, foundation, and then they <laughs> built tall, and then it collapsed. It's over, yeah. And and then I asked them to put uh, things to back together and and start a new uh, project, which was um, create something that looks like sales enablement in your company, and then. Every table put something where sales enablement was in the center and marketing was over here and service was over here uh-huh. and manufacturing was over there. And, uh, and, it, it, and then I asked them to interpret what they have created. So there's the process of creation cool. and then there's a the process of interpretation. And it was really wild because they discovered their belief system where they erroneously believed that you know, in their minds that sales enablement is the most important function in the company. I love that. You know, we used to use Legos in Myers-Briggs training because if you put all the same type on a person, I mean, if you're an ESTJ and everybody's ESTJs, you don't want them all on the same team because if you give them Legos, they're going to build the most boring thing ever. You want everybody different on the team to have a diverse team because when you tell them to build a house, they're building castles and moats and really cool things. Uh, and the people are all the same are going to build a little square box. And so it's it's really fascinating to see what you can teach people with Legos. I have a tetrahedron that I use. Uh, It's a two-piece puzzle. I don't know if any of you guys have ever seen this, but you give this to people at MIT, like the geniuses, they can't put it together for a while. (laughs) It's supposed to look like, um, let me get this together here. It's supposed to look like this when they put it together. It's just two pieces. But right. the problem is, is they're so used to putting it together like different ways and they can't get it. And the trick to it is you put the two square pieces together and twist it. Nobody thinks to twist to get the piece the way they want. And that's what I want you guys to do is think about the twist because you're not, you've always just stuck at things together and think that they're going to fit. You got to go one step further and think about the twist. Where can you get those? Just wood, 
block tetrahedron look it up on amazon or something i've seen them and actually i'm doing a teaser video for Novartis where i'm passing it through to the screen and he's going to take it because now we're on zoom we can't be together and then he's going to try to put it together and then the next guy he'll pass it you know what i mean so we're going to play around with it to let's see how it goes on zoom but you know it's cool there's different things like i, I some of the things i use i got my little prop box like uh, on assumptions what, what do you think the roman numeral is for a four on a um on a clock this one surprises a lot of people. I don't know if you could see that. Look at the four. Oh, that's four. They're four, right. uh, four right. I's instead right. of an IV. And right. there's, so when we talk about assumptions, I have little things. You know, we, we think things are going to be a certain way. Sometimes they're not exactly what we think. That puzzle doesn't go together exactly as we think. That the, Not everything is what we assume. And I want you guys to think about some of the things that you think are the way they should be. But maybe you need to question it a little bit. Awesome. <laughs> um, Jonathan, do you want to chime in? Um, one quick question. Well, I, I, it's a thing that I experienced, actually. I, I just did the Landmark Forum. I don't know if anybody's done that. Mm. Um, uh, the way I describe it, it, it just it, it removed the yoke of oppression and depression of 60 years for me. Wow. Because it has you look at what you don't know that you don't know. Right. And by uh, and, and it was kind of like in a, in a moment, it had me, uh, it gave me my insights into all of my own stories that were both helpful to, for me to be successful, but also were very limiting. And by letting go, by being able to see the stories you make up about things, and so it was a technique like therapy or anything like that, but like it was a technique that very jarringly and quickly um, removed the stories that you make up about your home life. And then you then have this level playing field where all of the assumptions and the fears and all the stuff that we've been talking about are removed. Hmm. So that along with, we've never met, but I also have a strong mindfulness and meditation practice. So the two together create a space where you really just observing things um, and then seeing them for how they are and then uh, curiosity arises I guess is a good awesome. I, yeah so anyway that would be my, Thank my you. comment I have to research that some more it's That's an amazing uh-huh. it really I was right. it used to be it used to be est est Do you uh, remember est uh-huh so I was cynical for three decades. My sister wanted me to do it forever. And then I, um, I just said, I'm ready for it. So it was quite an interesting experience about um, getting rid of all the things you're talking about through a process that allows you then to be more curious, more open, more receptive, less fearful, et cetera, et cetera. It was pretty cool. That's awesome. And it reminds me that um, the story of you is not always true. I mean, and we're back to perception. Right. <laughs> Tomorrow's and, show, if you guys listen to my right. show, I, tomorrow airing is uh, Bo Lotto, the, the king of perceptions, going to be on my show tomorrow. If you go to drdianehamilton.com and just hit the blog, you can read it. And he's just amazing. Look at some of his, um, his TED Talks. He does some great TED Talks on perception. Very fascinating stuff. But, well, I really, this has been, so, you guys are such a great group. I really enjoy doing this, Gerhard. Thank you so much, Diane. <laughs> It was so nice to, to be part of this forum. I, I, I'm always impressed with everything Gerhardt does, so I'm not surprised that you got such a great group here.